Greetings, friends. This is Chris Batts, your host of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In today's episode, I spoke with a Silicon Valley native who, with a friend of his, while associates at a big law firm, went out and launched their own law firm 12 years ago. This firm, and my guest, has now been a recipient of awards for law firm innovation. We discussed this and much more. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast and leave a review on iTunes. We interview corporate defense, law firm leaders, partners, general counsel, and legal consultants. You are listening to episode 50 of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Broadcasting from Kansas City, this is the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In each episode, you'll receive actionable ideas and hear personal leadership stories of both men and women serving as leaders and executives in the legal industry. Enjoy a front row seat as Chris Batt speaks with general counsel, legal consultants, and law firm leaders and law partners at the top corporate defense law firms from around the United States. Welcome to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Batts with The Lion Group. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Michael Marazda, founding partner and CEO of Ramon Law. Michael directs the firm's strategy, partnerships, and firm recruiting. After law school, Michael started as an associate at Ropes and Gray before launching Ramon Law in 2008. He has presented on innovations in law firm management and business models at Harvard Law School, Stanford Law School, to name a few, as well as received awards from the Financial Times and the American Bar Association. Michael received his law degree from Columbia University School of Law and undergrad from University of California, Berkeley. Welcome, Michael, to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate your your time and the busy schedule and with COVID, Michael. Let's just jump in. So it's fun to learn that you were raised in Silicon Valley and technology was an early part of your life. Would you share with my listeners some of that Genesis story for us about being raised in Silicon Valley? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, it was is particular uh, gift to be raised in Silicon Valley in those days, uh, the '80s, where we were already learning some very basic computer programming in kindergarten. To give you some idea, the sponsor for my school, or at least the the corporate uh, relationship, was with Lockheed Martin, and we got to tour oh, wow. Lockheed and see some of uh, their technology. So it was a very very exciting time to see supercomputers uh, in first grade in your in your field trip. As a result, I always had a great fascination with computers, the early days of the internet. And I just grew up around technology companies, worked for technology companies, you know, in high school, had my own little dot com in high school, and even through college got to be around tech companies. So it was, it was a really exciting time. Yeah, it's amazing. So that was Easy Web Mall, correct? You launched that? That's right. Yes, yes. A, a dot com with my brother at the time. That's awesome. Did you end up selling it? No, you know, actually, it was a very good experience. We we started it right before the bubble burst, and we didn't have good lawyers. So uh, a lot of our we had a lot of customers who didn't pay up, and we didn't have a very good contract. And that was a very good learning experience. That's it's, amazing. Uh, it, it taught us how, how important law is to having a good startup and a good good business ultimately. What an experience! If I understand correctly, you served a little bit of time at Napster and Checkpoint Software, correct? That's correct. So uh, during, again, during those dot-com days, uh, I worked for a few dot-coms that don't exist anymore. Right. E-Tracks is an example of this. Uh, and then Napster is another example. One doesn't exist anymore. But Napster, as uh, most people who are old enough to remember who have studied the case in law school, uh, ultimately went down over questions of the ability to share music without paying the artist. So that experience, again, really was a great intersection between technology and law and art, actually, and how how those three come together and how the law influences technology and art. And again, was was ultimately a bridge for me to want to go to law school. Checkpoint Software is the one company that's still around and thriving, a a tech company. Uh, They they do internet security, which again is now very relevant because uh, cybersecurity is becoming more and more important, but had less of a legal element to it. UC Berkeley and was it psychology, I think you did an undergrad in? That's correct. Psychology and, uh, and a minor in uh, international studies. Was it always just kind of that thought that you were going to go to law school after that point? No, actually, no. So I, I started off wanting to go into medical school. It was uh, a transition from medical school to psychiatry to psychology and really loved the topic of psychology. I was going to become a, a psychologist. But then I, I did several 
a few internships uh, while in college for professors uh, actually studying the therapy sessions. And I just found that it wasn't for me. I thought it would be quite frankly too difficult for me to spend day in, day out for years and years with uh, schizophrenics uh, in therapy, which, which was my original intention. And then these experiences that I mentioned earlier in the technology field, the places like Napster that I was working, and also my interest in international relations, which was, was my minor, that's what ultimately led me to want to go to law school with a focus in international law. That's excellent. And so you went from Silicon Valley and then you went to New York City for Columbia, correct? Exactly. Totally different perspective, at least back then. I think New York has changed quite a bit. But at that point, New York, Wall Street, Columbia Law School is very Wall Street oriented. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the idea of working for a startup you know, at that time meant you know, being a hot dog vendor in Central Park. They didn't really have the, you know, it was, it, it, you were meant to go to a uh, white shoe Wall Street law firm uh, and uh, have Goldman Sachs as a client. So totally different perspective, a great perspective to have. Uh, and, and those two different views actually, again, really frame a lot of the way I think today. So you, you ended up at Ropes. Did you summer there, I think you said? Yes, I, I was summer associate at Ropes and Gray uh, in the New York office, in the San Francisco office. And then uh, I started as an associate in the San Francisco office, which was uh, a new office for Ropes and Gray. So it was kind of a little bit entrepreneurial for one of the oldest firms in the United States, but opening uh, a new office for them. Yeah, it's a fantastic firm. So talk about your client base. Talk a little bit about your experience in practicing in Silicon Valley for Ropes. So my clients at that time, so Ropes and Gray, is, as uh, many of your listeners uh, will know, is an old line, great traditional law firm. Most of their clients at that time, well, not most, but uh, most of the clients I was working for anyway, were private equity shops. So Bain Capital also represented uh, Morgan Stanley, did some work for Johnson & Johnson. So mega deals, right? We were working on multi-billion dollar deals. Again, very different perspective than what I grew up with. Uh, which I really appreciated. And the Ropes and Gray culture was a great culture. In fact, if we're going to put together the, the elements we talked about, the Silicon Valley culture I grew up with, the Wall Street culture of Columbia Law School, I felt the Boston culture of Ropes and Gray uh, was a very interesting uh, academic feel to it that I loved. So I, I had started off uh, working for uh, doing work for these huge multi-billion, uh, to some extent, multi-billion dollar deals. You know, my roots really called out to me. I really wanted to do more of the startup work. So I transitioned at Ropes and Gray to doing more work for venture capital and early stage startups. Interesting. So at what point was that imagination and creativity going when you started thinking about innovation and law firm business models? Constantly. <laughs> Constantly. So it never really went away, right? I mean, there was always that itch of what can we be doing better? So my undergrad was UC Berkeley, where most of my friends were actually computer science and electric engineering folks, even though that was, even though that was technically in a different school. I was school of uh, letters and sciences, and they were in the engineering school. But I lived with them. There were, there were six guys, five of them were engineers and me. Uh, so they went, they all went to tech companies, or at least worked with tech companies. Most of my friends, when I had come back from New York to Silicon Valley, most of my friends were working for companies like Google, which at that time had, I think, just gone, gone public, or Facebook and Twitter, which were relatively, well, in the case of Twitter, was a startup and Facebook was still an early stage company. So seeing that perspective was always something in my mind about, well, what are tech companies doing and why aren't we doing them as in the law firm world when we're advising these tech companies? And like I said, Ropes and Gray had amazing lawyers. We were, we were a great team of lawyers. So we were advising these cutting edge clients, but the firm itself, uh, which was as good as law firms go, that's how we felt, but still was kind of operating like it was the 1990s at best. <laughs> No, not <laughs> old line, yes. large law firms. No. So yeah. were you one to be vocal with the partners to try to suggest changes? A little bit. The structure, again, at Ropes and Gray was such that even though it was very collegial and team oriented, there wasn't that much room for internal changes. To some extent, of course, there was. And I was very lucky that I was in the San Francisco office, so there was a little bit more of that. But from my perspective, I felt like there was an opportunity, not necessarily to change ropes because ropes is doing very well and they're still doing very well, um, but that there was an opportunity for a different type of law firm altogether. 
a different structure. And so my coworker and I at the time, Yaakov Silberman, who had just moved from the Boston office to the San Francisco office, huh. had very similar views on this. His move is relevant because when he moved from Boston to San Francisco, obviously his email address stayed the same. His phone number stayed the same. He kept the Boston number. It didn't matter where he was. And so it made it strikingly clear. And and I had clients all over the world. It didn't matter if I was sitting in this fancy office in San Francisco or working from home. So we started to, to talk about, well, what could we be doing if we were to build a law firm from scratch, which you know big firms can't do because they have their systems. It's not so easy for them. It's not that they're they're foolish. They're very smart people. They just they're they are structured the way they're structured. So we felt that a law firm needs to be started from scratch that is built based on the realities of even the 21st century. I mean now we're in 2020. So that's not asking much, right? <laughs> but that is built on video conferencing. It's built on cloud computing. Um, it's built on uh, more freedom for the attorneys and more innovation. And so actually, we started to come up with the idea late one night uh, while we were working on a deal. And we, we went to dinner together in the middle and started talking about it. When was this meal? When did you guys have that conversation? This would have been probably around November of 2007. 2007. Okay. Yes. And then it took us four months from that meal to our launch of Ramon, March of 2008. Oh, wow. So you guys did it six months before the crash. Wow. Yes. I can't say we saw the crash coming. Otherwise, I could have made a lot of money in other ways. Uh, <laughs> but but it, it did. Uh, the, the crash, quite honestly, helped us, right? Because uh, the a lot of the changes that were inevitable that we saw coming at that time were significantly accelerated by the crash. Was Ropes surprised by you guys giving notice and going and doing this? Not that they showed us. I mean, I don't know. It's it's hard mm -hmm. to know. I think they're they're very again very amicable, very very nice folks, and they referred some work to us, and uh, we we nice. referred work to them. And you know, like getting the law firm, it's a group of people, right? So the the ones we had relationships with were very supportive. That's great. And I'm assuming you took clients with. You know, we actually didn't because uh, because we decided to build this firm from the ground up, which meant oh, wow. that at least the first three years, really, we were just focused on building the platform. Oh, wow. And most of our clients, Yakov's as well, were these huge clients still. So we weren't going to take Bain Capital with us. I mean, that, that wasn't right. going to happen. Right. But we did have clients that we were able to bring on pretty early because, as I mentioned, a lot of my friends were in the startup world and technology world. And we were able to go and get them as clients when they were starting their companies and they were they were thrilled that there was uh, an option that would give them more flexibility. That's awesome. So what was it like those first three years? And even maybe when, when did you guys start adding other kinds of talent? Well, kind of right off the bat. So that's that when I say we were building the platform, what I really mean is uh, obviously the technology side, getting things like malpractice insurance, administrative support, all that ready, but yeah. also bringing in the attorneys, making sure that we have the talent to take on the work. And our rule number one was always to create a better top tier law firm, meaning that everything else we did, you know, the fact that we're using cloud computing, video conferencing, all of that stuff is just a way to get the better quality law firm, which for us means highest quality talent working closely together to serve clients well um, with as little friction as possible. So we didn't want to take on a bunch of clients so we had all the right talent. So the first three years, in addition to using technology and getting the administrative support, was recruiting the lawyers that we had faith in doing the top tier work. That was obviously the hardest part. I mean, when you build something from scratch and we weren't a spinoff, it's not like we like we, did, we didn't just take a bunch of clients with us and a bunch of associates. We weren't even looking to practice law ourselves. So uh, it was very, very hard to get that first piece in there. Uh, and that's why the first three years were so hard. Hi, listeners. This is Chris Batts, legal recruiter and owner of The Lion Group. My team and I place legal and compliance talent around the United States and are known for our level of communication, speed, and strong track record. If you're an employer hiring your first attorney or first general counsel or adding talent to your corporate legal department or compliance team, we should talk. Also, if you're a corporate defense law partner or group wondering about your options for a lateral move, we should also talk. Every aspect of our process is confidential, fast and thorough. Contact us by going to our website, findthelions.com, or you can text the word headhunter to the number 44222, and then complete the web form and we'll follow up with you shortly. Now back to the show. 
do me and do my audience a favor, Michael, and just share with them what is Ramon Law. Ramon Law is, I would say the easiest definition is, is a streamlined, high-end global law firm. Okay. What that means <laughs> is that we are not a virtual law firm. We used to be, and I'll talk about that in a moment. We are not a virtual law firm that I define as a law firm that uh, where the attorneys keep 80% of what they bring in, but they don't really get any support from the firm. And they're all kind of like solos. I think of it kind of as like being an Uber driver, being a lawyer in a, in a platform or an Airbnb. So we're not that. The firm is providing everything for our attorneys. It's highly collaborative, but the workforce is distributed. Um, our attorneys are spread over 33 different offices in 10 different countries. Okay. We do leverage cloud computing and video conferencing for collaboration. We have offices, but we keep them efficient. Most of our attorneys do work remotely. So that's the broad definition. Now, would you like me to kind of go through the process of how we started off and, and, and how we became what we are? Yeah, let's do that. Go for it. Okay. So that's the hardest part, right? Defining what Ramon is, you have to kind of have the story. So yes, we, when we started in 2008 with the goal of creating the next generation white shoe law firm, we decided the best way to do that is leveraging technology to bring in the best lawyers and allowing them to keep more money, right? And giving them more flexibility. So the way we did that was we, we had an 85% 15 split. The firm would take 15% to provide um, overhead support. The attorneys would keep 85%. That 85% would then be split between the attorney who brought in the work and the attorney that did the work. Okay. Now, within three years, what we found was that that was just too limiting. With 15% going to overhead, the firm couldn't really provide the resources that we thought were absolutely necessary in order to do bet the company litigation, to do multi-billion dollar M&A, to do serious IP work, for example. Working virtually is is great, but sometimes you need a conference room to talk to a client and, and going to Starbucks doesn't always cut it. You need to have a room where you could lock the doors because you're holding important IP, for example. So three years in, we decided to shift more into what I consider a hybrid law firm. So we shifted from a 85-15 uh, split to a 70-30 split. Okay. The firm then takes 30% for overhead and the attorneys keep 70%. The 30% then covers everything that a, an attorney usually gets at a conventional law firm. So secretarial support, IT support. We have the best technology for security. We certainly don't ask our attorneys to bring their own devices. We have a great marketing team, Westlaw, you know, retreats, all these things that cost money, as well as things like office space. Again, streamlined. So not office space that's unused, but office space attorneys can use if they need to from time to time. And as well as a back office where administrative support can do large document production, things like that. And so we found that the 70-30 is actually the, the perfect medium. So middle point between large conventional firms with high bureaucracy, high costs and instability and virtual law firms that we felt were not really we're really just a collection of lawyers under one brand. So that's where we've been uh, in the last nine years of the 12. And then you basically say that you guys are not a virtual firm now. Well, you know, that's an interesting thing because virtual law firm is not some kind of scientifically defined term, right? Right. I think from my perspective, a virtual law firm means a firm where there are no associates, there's very little actual shared resources. The attorneys are getting the benefit of the brand of the firm and the network, but otherwise they're really on, on their own. That way, we definitely aren't that. Well, what's your guys' headcount right now? We're now at 135 lawyers. 135. Okay. That's yeah. awesome. That's exciting. So we're going through a very historic pandemic right now, and you've been pulled in and quoted for things about innovation and changing law firm models. What is the law firm structure that's going to thrive post COVID? Well, I think, you know, there's lots of sensationalistic press because that sells clicks right nowadays. So I don't think there is one model. I think there's going to be at least three categories of high-end corporate law firms, right? Of course, there are all, all, all sorts of different law firms as well. So I'm not going to uh, get, get into that. But let's say the AMLAW 200 firm uh, model, I think, is going to probably split into a few categories. 
And yeah. we're, we've already been seeing that happen in the last uh, decade. Mm-hmm. There's, uh, the, I think the the old line white shoe firms are probably not going to change all that much, uh, despite uh, you know what some might say. I think Wachtell and Cravath are going to be just fine. Yeah. Um, I think the then there's the other group that's going to be a lot more like the big four. Mm-hmm. So let's say the Dentons and the DLAs and those um, run much more like a just a massive corporation. Mm-hmm. We've seen that happen over the last, let's say, 15 years, uh, or at least progression into that that model. Yep. Then I think the, the third category is going to be, this is a very broad category, of all those firms that are not either A or B, right? They're, they're not the top tier white shoe firms. They're not the massive, massive mega firms, and they need to decide what they're going to be. And I think those are the ones that are going to have the the hardest time if they don't figure that out soon. Yeah. So I think in terms of specifically post COVID, what we're going to see is that clearly these firms have realized that office space is not nearly as necessary as they thought. Um, lots of research and surveys have shown that majority of lawyers and even partners, but certainly associates prefer working from home, uh, but they have long-term leases. So it's not like they're going to change overnight. The firm cultures weren't built for this. So it's going to take time. But they've also found that a lot of their administrative needs, what they thought were administrative needs, weren't actually necessary. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be cutting down on administrative time as well. So I think over the course of the next 10 years or so, meaning the time it takes to move out of a lease and for new people to come and and, and some people to go, eventually you're going to have a much larger group of firms, maybe even the majority of uh, big law firms that will have adopted what I call the hybrid model, which means they'll have offices. I don't think they're going to have an office for every lawyer. I think they're going to have probably a mix, some partner offices, some private conference rooms, some phone booths, some open office space, and a lot of people just working from home using video conferencing. Mm -hmm. I think that's already happening now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that's going to to certainly uh, be accelerated because of COVID. Michael, um, along with this line of uh, looking at the legal industry 10 to 20 years out, let's talk about non-attorney ownership. It's affecting and, you know, you've got the the state of Arizona um, looking at it, California, a number of different states, Utah. Yeah, I have a lot of fascination with it myself, but I'd love to hear your thoughts as far as the implications of non-attorney ownership of law firms. Yeah, this is actually something I've been following very closely. I think it's very important. So first of all, I think we should trace back, why is it that law firms have to be owned by lawyers in the first place, right? As the lawyers who are listening will recall from our ethics classes in law school, it's because the the idea is that if non-lawyers own uh, a profit interest in the law firm, they are going to uh, unethically pressure clients to pay or take or pressure the lawyers to bill more or take on matters that they shouldn't take on. It comes from the right place. But I think that now the reality is the way that law firms are structured, at least the bigger ones, it, when you're talking about the smaller ones, I can understand if it's a two-person shop, maybe you don't want it to be owned by a huge faceless corporation. But when you're talking about the really large law firms, they're already managed in such a way that you could really have some great safeguards, which they already have anyway, to make sure that the clients are treated ethically, that the work is done ethically. And you can certainly have a wall like they they do in the UK and Australia where they've opened this up between the decision-making of how to build a client or take on clients, which can be done by lawyers versus the business side, right? Which is also true in medicine, by the way. Same same issue in medicine where doctors have to own the medical practice, but but lots of hospitals have found a way around that by having the business side as a separate entity. So given the reality of how law is practiced now, I think the bigger law firms could be run a lot more like like the big four or probably a better example would be like uh, investment banks that have even got, gone public, like Goldman Sachs. And I think these ethics rules can be modified to make sure that the ultimate issues of client concern are still safeguarded. That being said, if you do that, I think it's very, very good ultimately for the public. I think it's good for everybody. It's good for the lawyers and it's good for the public. I think it's good for the public because we are seeing that there's a lack of access to lawyers, particularly at the lower price range uh, in this country. This is actually the the reason that Utah and Arizona have, have been opening up. DC actually did it before anybody else. 
So I think that's going to be the case. I think for clients, I think for for lawyers, it's going to be better because it's going to create the different options for financing. You know, in fact, right now it's it's already happening through more creative methods of getting litigation financing. But to be able to finance a firm or to finance a practice without having to bear all the risk yourself, just like other corporations, I think that's a good thing. I think this will also allow for more innovation because if you can get outside financing, again, you can take more risks, not at the expense of the client, and actually invest in technology and ultimately have a better product, which is better for the lawyers and it's better for the clients. Now, this begs the question of why isn't this happening? Why is it so slow here in the US when in England and in Australia, they did this long ago? And by the way, in other countries, they've allowed it from the beginning. It's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily, has, this limitation doesn't have to happen. And, and it's, I think it's simply fear. There's, there, there's the protection of the guild. There's the idea that if we open up, from the big law perspective, if you open up, the big four accounting firms are gonna take up our work. I don't think that's true. I, I just don't. Again, you can look at what happened in the UK. That did not happen. The magic circle firms have not been hit by this. Even the mid-sized firms, there's no indication that opening uh, opening up the what they call the ABS law firms has has had any effect on that. And there's certainly no evidence that there has been a, a difference in ethics between the alternative business structure law firms and the traditional law firms. So I think eventually it will open up once our guild allows it to open up a bit. How soon do you think it'll happen? <sighs> Slow. It's going to take a long time. I, I think sure. you know, even Utah and Arizona are, are just testing the waters now. It's not like they've gone all in. And there's going to be a lot of questions. For example, Arizona, as far as I understand it, allows law firms to be owned by non-lawyers in certain circumstances. Okay. So once they form the law firm, let's say it's a law firm that's VC backed in Arizona. Can that law firm then represent clients outside of Arizona? Or can it hire lawyers outside of Arizona to represent clients in Arizona? As far as I know, and the ethics uh, lawyers that I've spoken to about this, nobody knows. So in fact, it's even a question with the UK. So these, these alternative business structure firms in the UK that we have relationships with, it was a question of whether or not we could have a cross referral arrangement with them and we couldn't get a clear answer on that. So we're still at the very, very beginning stages. And I think it's gonna be a while before certainly New York or California jump on. I mean, those two are very protective bars. There. Yeah. I, I personally think it's going to happen in this decade. Yeah. I think we're going to see it happen. Meaning meaning broadly happen uh, where it's all, all throughout the country? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, you should also know that my perspective of slow is maybe a little different. Than ours. I think this decade, 10 years is still pretty slow. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but yes, I mean, do you think it'll happen in two years? Uh, I think it'll happen by 2025. Oh, really? I think oh. I, th I think it could. I think it really depends economically. Um, if we see, I mean, there's just so much dry powder out there and the kind of capital and the innovation that's happening, the steps that the big four are already taking. I don't think they're law firm killers, but oh. I think there's going to be, like you said, I personally think Denton's is working towards very much a professional service model. Baker McKenzie's already there. I think DLA Piper will eventually get there, but those guys are barely any different than the big four. And look at the collaborations that are already happening with like Deloitte UK law firm interacting with uh, alliances in the United States. I mean, it's already happening uh, in that level. I think if the embargo is lifted, there's going to be a rush. I mean, so Reed Smith is the first US firm to have the NABS license in the UK. Yes, yes, I saw that. That's right. I personally hope it does happen within two years. Yeah. I wonder if it's going to happen in the same way that Uber happened, meaning that what what I'm seeing out there is kind of this slow encroachment through innovative means like litigation financing from hedge funds. There's also um, some innovative ways for hedge funds or or private equity to invest in IP in order to get involved in that kind of work. So, or, you know, taking equity in a certain, a, a separate arm that's owned by the law firm. Yep. So it's legal, but it's it's kind of a workaround, you know, or having having the law firm split into an operating company and a, and a yep. professional service company. So I think eventually it's going to slowly get, get there anyway, and then they'll change the law. In fact, you kind of, something people don't think about where this is happening, it's very regular that we don't even think about it, is that, um, law firms, big corporate, let's say AmLaw 200 law firms are technically practicing Delaware law, 
you know, with a California license or a New York license, for example. And I've asked a few ethics uh, professors about this, and it's not like there was ever an opinion issued, as far as they know, that allowed for this. It just eventually became the the way of the land. So, so it's just a question of how long that will take. Do you think mm-hmm. COVID is accelerating? Do you think COVID has had any effect on that? I think it is. I mean, I, I think it happened beforehand, but I think COVID's going to definitely accelerate it, especially because of the virtual nature of what's happening right now. Yeah. I think there's going to be a growing demand of reinvesting capital and allocating capital in effective ways. And I agree with you. I think the ABA and the bar associations are going to have their hand pushed a little bit, forced on them. You wonder about Reed Smith. I wonder if they're going to surprise the country with trying to take some capital and do something with it. And then you'll see a rush of other firms going into the UK to try to set up their own thing to do it. Imagine a Kirkland Ellis like setting up their own firm there that's already outrageously profitable. I mean, I would anticipate like a Kirkland doing an IPO and just feeding the drive for more profitability um, and a little bit of that understanding of greed that comes with large law firms. Sure. By the way, I, I should mention, we we also formed an ABS in, in the UK. So um, I did not know that. Yeah. I mean, it's it's without, you know, n- we're not looking to take outside capital. Yet. But uh, once, <laughs> once, once you, uh, since we're going to the UK anyway, it, it just made sense. It gives you more flexibility. Yeah. So yes, I think I, I get why Reed Smith would do it. And I would think any law firm thinking of going into the UK at this point um, would do it, should, should do it. Now, again, you have to be very careful about the ethics rules of does the UK entity then pay a percentage to the non-UK, to the US entity? There's, it's not clear. So we've got to be very careful with that. But yeah. yeah, anyway, you're making a good point. Yeah, I hope I hope it opens up in two years. It'll be interesting. It'll be fun. I'm yeah. I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. So I'm a Charlie Munger fan, and Bezos kind of stole this from him about. And so here's the question, and you'll probably know where I'm going with this: is what will never change in the business of law? So if we think of so much change happening to the business of law the past decade and decade before, and definitely going forward, in your opinion, what will never change in the business of law? Geez, that's so difficult, right? Because never is such a strong word. Uh, so, but let's say in the la- next hundred years, I think that uh, the relationship, the the importance of relationship between, let's call it the relationship partner and the client in our sector of the law. I, again, I think there, it, it's too difficult to generalize all law practice, but I would say in most of law practice, the attorney-client relationship is going to stay super important, even if you've got AI doing most of the work, (laughs) even for things that are considered mostly commoditized, and they're going to become more commoditized with time because of AI. I still think that the relationship between the relationship lawyer and the client is super important. And the reputation, therefore, of the relationship lawyers is going to continue to be paramount. I don't think that's going to change. It's awesome. It's a great answer. I have to agree. Let's pivot. I'm going to ask you another question. How do you define leadership, Michael? That's a, <laughs> okay, that's, that's a good question. I can tell you how I define good leadership. How, okay. How's that? <laughs> Go for it. I think a, a good leader is really someone who uh, knows how to bring people together and to inspire, right? Good. I think there's a, a quote of the Lubavitcher Rebbe who said, uh, a good leader gets people to want to do some, something. A great leader gets people to want to lead. And I think that's really a great leader. I don't think a good leader is, is somebody who's just telling people what to do or operates by force or fear. That might get something done in the short run. But if you really want to build something, you know, as, as the book Good to Great that many people read 10 years ago <laughs> said, uh, the, the best leaders are ultimately going to be humble. I try to be humble and the next generation to be ready to lead. And they make sure that everyone in the organization has a say, because I, I think that's ultimately going to make the best product. So that's what I think a good leader is. Thank you. Along those same lines, you can answer one or two or both, but do you have heroes in your life or who have been examples of leadership for you? Uh, uh, (laughs) Yes, I have heroes. There isn't just one or two, right? There are just, uh, there are lots. And uh, I've, I've looked to them throughout my life. I tried to have as many examples as possible, mentors throughout my life that came from different um, sectors. Any shout outs? Do you have any uh, shout outs? My parents, obviously, I want to thank okay. thank them. You know, they, they're my heroes. But at the beginning, Josh Green, who who started a venture law group, was, was a great mentor at the beginning to help us uh, see things through and, and starting a new law firm and thinking differently. 
There have been friends, uh, Richard Cash now is a mentor of mine who has been on boards of many publicly traded companies. He helped guide us and see things from the client's perspective early on. Many, many others. I'm not going to name them all because I'm sure I'll leave people off and I don't want to do that. I think it's important to constantly have new mentors as well as old mentors in your life to guide you through different perspectives and different times. For me, the ideal sense of a leader is actually Moses. Again, from the, the book, Good to Great, the way that they, their research showed that the best leader is actually a humble leader who gets the next uh, generation ready, who is also make sure that others are participating. And uh, when you read the, uh, the story of Moses, uh, the prophet Moses, that, that's very much what he was. He was a strong leader. Is not cowardly or weak, not at all. He was inspiring, but at the same time, very, very humble. And when others had an opportunity to lead, he was happy for them to take that role. And then he also prepared the next generation, which is Joshua, to lead. And that left the last thing influence throughout the, the majority of the world, 3,500 years later. So, so to me, that would be kind of the, the ideal prototypical leader. That's awesome. I love it when people mention Moses because it's always funny. I know in scripture it says he was the humblest of all men. <laughs> it, it's funny because if he wrote it himself, that's right. that's particularly interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but but in that case, you know, it's it's just there are so many examples within within yeah. the story yeah. where um there's one in particular that I'm thinking of where there were two individuals, I think their name was Eldad, and I forget the name of the other one, but that they started prophesying, it says. And Joshua came to Moses and said, these two guys are prophesying, what should we do? Should they be put to death or what? <laughs> and then Moses said, no, that's great. I wish more people would prophesy, you know, this is wonderful. And so again, to even take, taking out the religion from it, just the fact that here's a leader that uh, in a time where despots were proclaimed themselves to be gods, uh, it was actually saying the opposite, that first of all, he didn't want to be the leader. And secondly, that he wanted more people to take on leadership. And I think that was really special. Yeah, that's awesome. Next question for you. What has been the most memorable day for you in your career? Well, the most memorable day would, if I had to pick a very specific single day, would be the first day of Ramon. So uh, okay. when we launched Ramon, March 1st, 2008, I moved into a, a house with my co-founder, Yaakov, so we could work in the basement together. Oh, wow. uh, and I remember that day very clearly. It was a feeling of absolute um, joy and freedom. You know, again, I, I loved my prior job. Ropes and Gray will always be grateful for that job. I loved the first day there as well. But I just remember it was that day when I was transitioning. I think I I just got I gave up my old BlackBerry and was getting a new BlackBerry <laughs> for people who remember what BlackBerry is. And just feeling this sense of, of joy of trying something new um, as I was uh, going for a walk that day for lunch. So that definitely would be the most memorable. It was, uh, it was, it was scary, but it was, uh, it was very joyous. Michael, what excites you most about coming to work every day? Well, most of my work nowadays is interacting with people, right? Whether it's our lawyers or our staff or clients or potential new recruits or business partners uh, that we work with. So it's, it's real pleasure and it's real privilege to spend all day getting to talk to really smart, interesting people uh, and, and to connect with them. So, I mean, I think it's as simple as that. It's that personal connection I look forward to. It's awesome. So we're going to transition to more kind of conversations about your personal life. You're married. How long have you been married? For almost 11 years. It'll be 11 years next month. Okay, great. Yes. Congratulations. And you guys Thank have you. three kids? Yes. Thank God we have three children. Yes. One is turning uh, 10 in a couple of days. Oh my. Uh, and the other one is seven and the youngest is four. Oh my gosh. And you guys are done. According to my wife, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she gets to call the shots, so yes. <laughs> That's awesome. How have you guys been dealing with COVID? I mean, how has that affected family life and just this year of craziness? Yeah, it was very difficult, particularly at the beginning, because it was the case with most parents. The kids had to no longer physically go to school, so going uh, to online school. <laughs> and, and at the beginning, because everybody in the neighborhood was using up more bandwidth, uh, the internet was very bad, so we switched to, <laughs> to different internet. But the first first week was very, very difficult, of course, uh, especially with these little kids at home. And during the rainy season, it got a lot easier as we figured out how to deal with that. It's also been a special time. You know, it's obviously a tragic moment in the world, so we are aware of that. But it's it's been nice to have more family time, 
and be with them. And as, as difficult as schooling them online, it's not homeschooling, obviously, we're not the ones doing it, but being there with them when they were online, it was very, very difficult, but a very, I think, important experience to see what it was like. From a professional perspective, since I've been working from home for 12 years, effectively, I'm very grateful that that transition was easy. So yeah, overall, very stressful, very, very busy eight months, but not not too bad. And does your wife work? No, she doesn't, which made it much easier. That's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. great. And do you guys typically do vacationing in the summer, get away? We do. So this year, actually, we, we got lucky. So we just decided to take a, a vacation in the winter instead of the summer. Oh, nice. Even though we usually go in the summer. So we, we were in Israel for the winter. So right when we got back is when the COVID stuff started. So we, we got our we got our fix in right oh, before, wow. which is very fortunate for us. <laughs> yeah. Very fortunate. That's lucky. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, we got lucky. So Michael, do you have any uh, side hobbies or uh, personal passions or anything like that? Yes. <laughs> like, I, I like a, a lot of things, but I guess uh, most recently I've been particularly interested in archaeology. And as odd as this may sound, I've really been into reading about Sumerians and, and awesome. the fall of the Bronze Age. I recently reread Gilgamesh, oh, wow. uh, which, which was fun. That's awesome. So that's not, I, I guess that COVID, because a lot of other options have been closed, particularly here in Northern California, where the guidelines are pretty strict. I've just been reading a lot more books and spending a lot more time with family. Yeah. Do you have any book recommendations or what you're reading right now outside of Gilgamesh? Uh, well, Gil Gilgamesh is a simple read, right? That, that was a quick <laughs> read. So I'm reading this book called uh, The Beginning of Wisdom by Leon Cass. Uh, Leon Cass is a, a University of Chicago professor in, I think, bioethics. He was actually uh, George W. Bush's uh, bioethics uh, advisor. Um, but the book is taking a perspective on, uh, on the book of Genesis, not from a religious perspective uh, and also not from an archaeological perspective, but from a philosophical perspective. Uh, and it's doing a deep dive. And because philosophy and psychology have, have always been my passions along with ancient cultures, it brings it all together very nicely. So I'm really enjoying uh, reading this book. That's exciting. Here's a question. Knowing that you have now launched a law firm and it was 12 years ago, what advice would you give an attorney in a firm who's considering launching his own firm or her own firm? I would say, you know, it's an exciting thing to do, but just be very aware of the fact that there's a lot more work than you would think there is. And when you're small, when you're, you're you know, have just a few lawyers, it's particularly difficult because then you can't have a dedicated IT person, a dedicated accounting person, a dedicated marketing person. Even if you have a dedicated person answering your phone, for example, and that person is sick one day, then you're stuck you know, doing that. And so that's why when we started the firm, those first three years were very, very difficult for that reason. We were definitely not making money then either because the costs are going to be so high in proportion to what you bring in starting out. That's not to say you shouldn't do it. It might be worth it for all the other benefits that you get from having your own firm, namely freedom, uh, the pride of building something. Um, but I think people often underestimate the costs in time just to set something up. Michael, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone who listened to this episode of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. If you haven't already, please take a moment and subscribe. Also, we would love your feedback. You can leave feedback in three easy ways. You can go to the blog post on our website. You can click Give Feedback link in the show notes on your device. And then thirdly, you can text the phrase LFL podcast to the number 44222. That's LFL P-O-D-C-A-S-T. And thank you. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. This podcast is for education purposes only. This content cannot be used for commercial use without written permission from the Lion Group. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes.